that you caught me on the radio. <laughs> so, you know, I, I had that little stint for about six months. I was trying to help get KDRP off the ground. And so I was just doing it as a pro bono operation. <laughs> so, um, as you know, if anyone doesn't know, is I published my book on, uh, called Wanted Mountain Cedars Dead and Live. Last year in the middle, middle of the pandemic, the pandemic was actually good for me because it helped me really to focus and start going inwards and thinking about these unseen issues that are actually uh, driving a lot of the ecology in the hill country. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and two of these things are the fungi in the soil and then also the car carbonate karst geology that's underneath. And uh, I started seeing more and more connections between all of these issues the more I study. Here, hold on, wait. Yeah, uh, there we go. Okay, so before we can start, we, we kind of like want to think about how the Texas Hill Country used to be. And a lot of people might say, oh, it was covered all with junipers. I'm like, no, it wasn't. Other people will say, oh, it was covered by all grass. And I've said, no, it's not. You know, by the 1950s, yes. But before that, you know, back in the 1600s, 1700s, and early 1800s, it was dominated by patchy mosaic of dense uh, old growth woodlands and forests shin oak and uh, red oak thickets. In fact, a lot of these Texas red oak thickets occurred on top of hillsides where you don't see it anymore. And that's because they had more soil back then. And then you had integrated all with that all mixed in were prairie grasslands, but never endless seeds of grass. It was like the grasses were here, grasslands here, <coughs> larger one here, smaller one there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Wildlife abounded inside of these, uh, inside the woodlands and forests. The, uh, the soils were described as dark and rich, and spring flows were sustained and abundant. And most of the forests and woodlands were old growth, which means more uh, in the hill country about more than 250 years old, and they contain many mountain cedars. Uh, and I'll say specifically Juniperus ashii and some Juniperus avata which is a more ancestral juniper that has been uh, DNA sequenced uh, as occurring in the hill country. And a lot of the times these days people say, oh, look at all the cedar breaks out there. I'm like, no, those are not cedar breaks. Those are thickets. Anything that tears your clothing off when you're trying to get through it and pokes you in the eye, that's gonna be a cedar thicket uh, composed mostly of bushes. But 150 years ago, the cedar breaks were a forest, like old growth forest, where people could like be on horseback and ride through them. <clears throat> they were uh, extensive, they had rich soil. The largest uh, noted was the Colorado River Bay breaks that consisted, consisted of more than 500 square miles. And inside of these forests, the mountain steers were larger and they grew as trees with well-defined central trunks. They were reported to be homes for jaguars, black bears, passenger pigeons, ocelots, and wolves. One person described walking through one of these cedar breaks as walking through nature's cathedral, which is a totally different from what we have today. And today what we have is mostly is on the right-hand side, you have uh, bushy cedars, and as opposed to having these strong you know, tree-like well-defined trunks, they are multi-branch, mostly at the, at the ground and inside of them, that bottom picture shows what it looks like inside. And like I said, it's a thicket, you can't really get through it. The picture there on the right is a fantastic uh, picture. It shows a, a remnant old growth cedar break on the left and to the right, there's your cedar thicket. So you can really see a side-by-side -side comparison. This is the only place I have found that gives a side-by-side -side comparison. <clears throat> so the tree mountain cedars were replaced by bushy cedars. And, uh, and you know, like this one down here on the left is, is what I call stick cedar. And a lot of people go around when they're managing inside of woodlands and forests, they get the loppers out and they start cutting them all saying, oh, these are so invasive, we need to get rid of them. I'm like, no, 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 no. Those are the ones that you want to keep. Those are the ones that are gonna grow up and to be part of a future uh, woodland and forest. They're helping it 
to regenerate. They serve as part of the understory. And, uh, and you can see the, the middle picture shows uh, one of these tree-like mountain cedars. Some people say they have more of a resemblance to a ponderosa pine tree. 150 you know, years ago, Texas rangers said that the wild turkeys would roost in these trees, which meant they had to have more horizontal branches. So totally different from what we see mostly today. And some have suggested that these uh, trees have a, uh, their different morphology might be that it's a different DNA, you know, maybe that these are hybrids. <clears throat> Others say that the, the growth form results from uh, sun and shade, like when they're in the shade that they grow up because you see a lot of trees doing that. It could even be moisture levels. But a question I've been asking myself lately is, what if uh, the, this form is actually driven by the soil fungi. Because when the bushes spread, they're spreading across degraded lands that have very, very little fungi. Is it possible that there's that connection with the fungi that allows it to grow into this more tree form? And it's, you know, I'm asking these questions because for the past 75 years, almost all the research of this tree has focused in finding how many ways can we uh, chain, burn, cut, kill, you know, the trees, how can we get rid of them? And as opposed to figuring out why are they here? Why are there so many of these bushy cedars? You know, what is the difference? What changed? Well, what changed? Well, it was mostly us. We caused the changes when we degraded the soils. 150 years of overgrazing and overpumping, clear cutting of old growth forests, especially the cedar break forest for building supplies and infrastructure needs. Uh, look at the picture there in the bottom right. That's in Llano County in 18, I think it's 61. And those are mountain cedar railroad ties that are being used to build the railroads. And uh, so these trees were cut down everywhere. They were cut down to make telegraph poles, telephone poles to serve as pier beams inside of uh, you know, foundations for homes, they were uh, for roof rafters. Uh, and it was like back then the side branches were used as fence posts. You know, These days it's the central trunk that's used as a fence post and the rest is burned. Uh, other things that happen and is also the massive brush pile burning, excessive fires until 1900, chaining, bulldozing, overuse of toxic chemicals. And then the icing on the cake is that the roaming herds of megafauna, you know, mostly the buffalo were all but exterminated. And other things that were helping to maintain the soils were things like passenger pigeons that would come in every, uh, it seems like every seven years or so, they would come in in droves and squash down the trees and smash them, but they would also drop tremendous amount of their, you know, bird poop that would help to feed the soil, you know, mycorrhiza and fungi and bacteria and stuff. Uh, there were two ways of clear cutting uh, late 1800s and then the mid 1900s, and both were followed by extended droughts. Some people have even proposed that these extended droughts these were actually caused by the clear cutting and the overgrazing, that it caused a shift in the climate, that it actually caused a drought. And then, of course, followed by flash flooding. That picture in the upper left was taken around Fisher, Texas, and uh, I think it's around 18. 71 and it just shows the massive amount of overgrazing that was going on in a in a land that really can't handle heavy overgrazing you know some other areas with deeper soil can but we have shallow soil uh, and it has been estimated that in the mid 1900s following that second wave an average is five inches of soil eroded now, I, I put this in here just for anyone who doesn't understand how destructive things can be. I've added this video. It's my first time to add one of these into a PowerPoint. So let's see if it works. This is not happening 150 years or 50 years ago. 50 years ago, a thing called chaining was very widely used where you get two uh, bulldozers and you put a giant chain in, be in between and you drag the land. And they're doing, they did this video is from 2008. 
Why right in the train around is something that's done out west on right kids. This could be a way that you could effectively treat large amounts of property. It is. And if it's good, the soil moisture is pretty hostile. It makes it easier to uproot some of these animals. You have to have a way to disturb the plant or the root system. Yes. And that's what the hope is with 18,000 pound chains that you just bring it through and destroy it. What we found is oftentimes it takes multiple passes in opposite directions, disrupts the bark system or pull the root system up enough that mortality rates will be higher. <laughs> It was dozers and earth movers that really came in and disturbed the landscape. And now we're using dozers and a massive chain to make it more suitable for wildlife. That's correct. It is exciting to get to do something new like this, and it's all work in progress. It looks to be working pretty well. You can tell a major difference on what they've done and what they haven't got to yet. Yes, you can tell major difference. That last image to me is what is needed on slopes, not coming in and yanking trees out by the roots. And that has actually starting to become pretty common with contractors throughout the hill country where they are literally yanking entire trees out by the roots. And since y'all know about and y'all appreciate uh, soil fungi, you can only imagine how that causes damage, how that damages the fungi. So this was probably one of the most destructive things that happened in the mid 1900s. And it seems to be having a resurgence. Um, so the result of uh, these poor land management strategies on the Edwards Plateau is that the hill country lost organic matter, fungi, and its seed bank. A lot of people will say that, oh, when I see these pioneering thickets of bushy cedars, underneath them there's nothing growing. I'm like, yeah, because most of the seed bank was eroded. And it, it takes time for all that to be brought it back in. Most of our wildlife, of course, there's no reason why we can't step in and add more seed. Their spring flows were reduced and less often flowed year round. And these are just pictures. I, I find this again and again and again throughout the hill country. Um, and a lot of people say, well, you know, when we cleared out the bushy cedars, we did it so we could get more grass to grow. Well, there's a problem with grass trying to grow in the hill country and the rest of the Edwards Plateau, wherever the soils are more shallow. Now, if you have deeper soils, four to six feet deep, uh, grasses will do a little bit better, but wherever the soil is more shallow than let's say two feet, it is extremely difficult for the grass to form a continuous cover. Uh, because the roots are not very strong. And if the karst underneath, and I'll explain a little bit more about the karst, but the uh, kar uh, karst, which is the limestone, if it's become sealed off, then the grass roots can't go into it. And instead the roots go horizontal, horizontally, which means that the next grass clump is way over here, as opposed to over here where you want it to form a nice dense cover. And so the grass tried, but the grass just could not succeed in uh, developing a, you know, closed uh, canopy. So in response to sparse grass erosion and rocky desertification, nature sent in a more aggressive, you know, uh, agent of the land, which is the pioneering thickets of bushy cedars. And this started just in the early 1900s. They replaced both old growth forest and healthy dense prairie grasslands. They spread where no other native plants could form a dense cover. they were also evergreens, so it helped. You know, if you got some kind of uh, severe rain event in the middle of winter, you still had that cover. They produce large amounts of organic matter and also their organic matter is slightly acidic. And so therefore helps to kind of balance the alkalinity of all the limestone. Um, and they possess tough woody roots. Uh, these pioneering thickets, and I do want to stress that I am now calling them pioneering thickets. Uh, Lisa O'Donnell, I know that she's on this. Uh, when she reviewed my book, gave the first run uh, about a year before I published, she asked if I could stop using the word invasive. I said, well, what about encroach? She said, no, that's not really right either. And then suddenly it just dawned on me, wait a minute. The reason why a lot of people think that, uh, why we should not be using the word invasive is because the USDA 
changed the meaning of the word to now mean not native. And that's why a lot of people now think mountain cedars are not native, but they are very native. Um, and so we just, we, uh, now the word invasive applies to not native uh, plants that spread and cause harm, while pioneering thickets of mountain cedars are native plants that are spreading where harm has already been done. Okay, uh, that there also could be called colonizers, but uh, pioneering thickets are spreading because they're here to actually try to put a stop and try to improve conditions. And initially, Here's up on the upper left is underneath the uh, pioneering thicket. And you, uh, this is taken just right after rain and you can see all the rain, you know, just kind of going through because there's not a whole lot of leaf litter built up yet. This little thicket is less than probably 10 years old. But if you see over here where my cursor is pointing, you can see where some of the, uh, the needles are starting to lock up and to form these little mini dams. And here's a close up right here. I just call these little like wrinkle berms, you know, they create uh, little wrinkles across the landscape. And what they do is they act like little miniature retention ponds. Now, when it rains, the water's going back up behind this and settle in as opposed to just washing out. And it's a very slow process. It can take a decade or two for it to build up slowly. And finally, eventually you get the picture on the right which is a matted layer of this uh, leaf litter. And the whole purpose of it is not to get grasses growing for livestock. It's not, you know, to give us, you know, what we want aesthetically or anything. It's to help the soil rebuild, to help restore it. <clears throat> and over time, the soil health will increase. So this is underneath uh, a mountain cedar that's about 75 years old. Um, it's just tons of organic matter built up in there. And at this point, other plants have started growing. And so you can get the, uh, it kind of helps to break up the maddenness of it. And remember I said also is that as these, as these areas degrade, they lose a lot of their seed bank. And it takes a while for the animals to start moving in. But as the animals start moving in, they start to break up that leaf litter. They, you know, armadillos will start scurrying around and digging in it. Turkeys will start scratching at it. So as they start doing that, it starts to break up the matted nature. Okay, all this organic matter, the shade from the canopy and the roots going into the ground, give the, or, uh, the soil fungi an energy shot. The organic matter and matted leaf litter protects soil from erosion and water evaporation. This creates a more hospitable environment for the soil biology. Now, uh, our muscular my mycorrhizal fungi, there's about 240 species, will be the first to, it's, now when I'm saying from at this point, this is kind of based on new research, you know, that's, it, it, and it's just starting to come out. It's starting to come out. So. But it, it, uh, it looks like that they're, they are the first to reactivate. And the thing is, is uh, the next ones that come behind it are gonna be your ectomycorrhizal. Now, ectomycorrhizal, they come up underneath forests. Well, if the area is degraded, then you're not gonna get all the ectomycorrhizal. Uh, plus also, they're not as tolerant of degraded conditions. While the arbuscular is being shown to be more tolerant of degraded conditions. And so that's how, as the juniper starts growing, it can start to reactivate it. Um, and the mountain cedars can actually start growing without these fungi being active, but as they grow, then it, they start to, uh, to activate. And as you know, on the left, there are just some hyphae, but here the enlarged picture there, the arbuscular are not the ones that you see with making the cool mushrooms and all that on, on the ground. Uh, that, that's their spore, which is not real exciting. You know, we're talking before the whole thing started about how people are not seeing things. And this is the kind of thing that we're not seeing what's going on. So we don't know it's down there. And so that's why it's so important to teach people about this. Um, as the soil health continues to improve and plant diversity increases, more fungi will, you know, become active. And one is the ectomycorrhizal. And it's uh, most common in forests and has more than 20,000 species worldwide. Uh, research suggests it can't handle degraded soils. 
Uh, on the right there, you have the false earth star. I see these the most underneath uh, older mountain cedars. They're very, very common, but you know, I also see a lot of the false puffball, which is up there on the left. Now, another type of mycorrhizal that will show up in, underneath these older juniper oak forests is the uh, one on the bottom there, the fairy fingers. And I had a little communication with Lisa O'Donnell, uh, who is with the Balconies Canyonlands Preserve. Uh, I asked her, where did you take this picture? Because apparently this mycorrhiza uh, grows with plants that are in the, uh, the heath family. And I was looking at what of our native plants, you know, grow with the heath family. Well, the one I came across was Texas Madrone. So, and I asked her, are these, um, were there any madrones? And she said, I don't remember seeing any madrones, but maybe there used to be madrones. And maybe, you know, cause people have always talked about how hard it is to grow them, to transplant them, that they are incredibly dependent on the mycorrhiza. But right here, it, this might be the one that they are using, uh, which I think is really, really cool. So uh, as was it, Claveria fragili, fragili. Now, another thing that's interesting as you get more soil biology is, uh, you know, the mycorrhiza will coat the roots of uh, oak trees, of, of all the trees, of all the plants, right? They, uh, y'all know how they, you know, that they coat them. And once the roots are nice and coated and all that, it prevent, you know, protects them from uh, diseases in the soil. And so then that can help reduce, uh, the rate of infection for oak trees. You know, it helps protect them against oak wilt. And, but then what I also found is that the bacteria, there is a bacteria that lives in the soil that is actually a good bacteria that seems, from what the research is showing, it looks like that the presence of the mycorrhiza is what helps to increase the numbers of this bacteria. And that is Pseudomonas uh, D. Trifacans, detrificans, I think that's how you say it. And that bacteria eats the bad oak wilt fungi. So the uh, oak wilt fungi, uh, the one, you know, the fungi that causes the bad oak wilt gets eaten by this good bacteria, but you don't get it eaten. Now, the strands here in this picture, those long strands, you know, of course, that's the fungi, the, the oak wilt fungi that's causing all the problems. And what's funny is that the people who made this slide, they had no idea that in the background here, do you see all those little elliptical, little pill-like thingies? That's all the good bacteria. So it's in there and it's eating up all of the bad fungi. So of course we got good fungi and bad fungi. Now, another thing that pioneering thickets do is that they boost plant diversity. A lot of people, when they get these uh, mountain cedars, they love to prune them all up because a lot of people are obsessed with, oh, we have this nature, it must be clean and orderly. No, nah, nature likes to be messy. And one of the reasons is that, well, when you got it all messy like this, all this, these new plants can come up and because the messiness acts as a na like nature's cage to protect them from the deer. And the more plants that you get, the more diversity, the more your soil biology, you know, improves. Uh, bottom right, there's a madrone tree coming up underneath a, a, a juniper. And, and maybe there's a definite re, a connection between the fairy finger uh, mycorrhiza, the juniper and the madrone. You know, uh, you know, remember I said how when the leaf falls, it creates a slightly acidic environment. Madrones like that, but maybe the fairy fingers also like that acidic environment. So there's probably that kind of connection going on here. So I said in the beginning that they help to, uh, that they serve as groundwater protectors. Now that you've had all that background, how do they actually increase, you know, or protect groundwaters? Um, when the soils and the vegetation cover degrade, as I showed that they definitely have been for over 150 years, the groundwater storage capacity of the underlying limestone bedrock will be reduced. <clears throat> and you can often see this wherever there's been a roadway cut, 
right after a roadway cut is made, you, it will have all this soil in there and all these fractures and all that. But after a few years of weathering, it seals up and looks like this, where it's just real solid. There's no more fissures are pretty much gone. <clears throat> and when you have a you know, situation like this, you can't get as many groundwaters in there. Uh, and that's because uh, the limestone bedrock is called carbonate karst. And carbonate karst is extremely porous and direct fractured bedrock that holds groundwaters and produces our artesian and gravity springs. The karst forms when carbonate rock is exposed to carbon, uh, carbonic acid, which is carbon plus you know, rainwater. And the more porous and fractured the karst, the more water it can hold. Uh, so this is uh, just natural bridge uh, caverns. And this is, I think it's called the Val, uh, Val, Val Didi, or I think, or something like that sinkhole or by Honey Creek. And there's a person right there. So you can see the scale of how large that thing is. And something that's fascinating is that mountain cedars follow carbonate karst. The little picture here, the little dots, that's uh, the range of the mountain cedars and the gray shows the carbonate karst. And you can see how it pretty much follows it. Now I didn't show the carbonate karst up here, uh, but you see how it follows it, it skips up to here in the Arbuncle Mountains and Oklahoma. So it pretty much uh, follows it. <clears throat> so the mountain cedar roots help to make the karst more porous. Um, here's a great picture here on the, on the left. See here, see that's a fresh cut. Do you see how broken and fractured it is? Do you see all the roots going down and how you have dirt, you know, soil getting all the way down in there? Now look at the far end where the ladder is. <clears throat> that was an area that was covered by sparse grass. And do you see the difference, how the sparse grass, that's, it's not very porous, you know, it's not very fractured. The woody roots of pioneering thickets of bushy cedars are strong enough to fracture and grow downwards, even where karst has closed up. The grass roots can't do this. Down the road might get to the point where it's opened up enough where the grass can start growing. Once the roots get down into the limestone, they excrete carbon-based chemicals that dissolve the limestone. As the trees improve the soil health, infiltration increases to move down more carbon-based chemicals, often flowing uh, down the narrow channels created by the larger roots. More infiltration also reduces downslope flooding. So, you know, there are all these multiple benefits. As more limestone is dissolved, the karst groundwater holding capacity increases. More groundwaters keep plants more hydrated to reduce fire risk and also more mycorrhizal fungi in the healthy soils reduces drought stress. So it's just all kinds of benefits. Uh, healthy karst acts as a carbon sink. Now this is something I just came across in the last few months I've been doing some studies. Uh, as the pioneering thickets of bushy uh, cedars open the karst back up, rainwater, organic matter, and carbon can move deeper and deeper. New research is finding that karst with healthy vegetation, microbes, and soil cover will function as a net carbon sink, when, meaning it will take in more carbon than it lets off. When karst is degraded through the removal of soil, microbes, and vegetation, the karst will lose more carbon than it takes in, meaning it doesn't act as a carbon sink. And future research will determine the percentages of, of this kind of stuff. And see, the thing is, is up until just about Less than 10 years ago, no one was studying the, car, the carbonate karst because they thought it, what it took in was equal to what was left, let, let out. And now they're finding, no, actually it's taken in more. It's, you know, and it's taking the carbon down deep. It's locking it up inside the caves and all that. So therefore it becomes even more important to maintain healthy soils and vegetation on top of the karst. So how long does it take for these pioneering thickets to restore the soil and the cars? Well, depending on severity of degradation, you know, if it's not that degraded, five to 10 years, or as long as a hundred years, with an average of about 30 to 60. But we need to be stepping in to mitigate and micromanage to speed up the process. One thing on the left here is adding contour bioswales. 
this moves water into the ground to start feeding the, the soil microbes and to start opening, helping to open that uh, karst back up. Now, another thing that's really cool, now, do you see the picture there on the bottom is uh, enlargement. This is a limestone eating bacteria that was discovered on a tomb in Egypt. And they're finding that these bacteria, uh, that, that they occur with nitrogen fixing plants, that they occur worldwide, and that they can actually be applied in any kind of, like for instance, you do a contour bias well, then you inoculate it with this uh, bacteria to help speed up the, uh, the uh, it's called limestone dissolution. You know, how, because they actually help along with the tree roots and everything that's being excreted, they actually help to break up and reopen the karst. So how can you age your pioneering thickets? Well, so, you know, if you have your thickets, you're like, and you just buy the land and you're like, well, how long have these thickets been here? You know, uh, if it takes, you know, an average of 30 to 60 years, well, you can look for the white bark fungus. Now this does not occur on every single mountain cedar, but it occurs on a lot of them, especially the bushy ones. And they were, uh, this is, was first identified in 1910 by Hild and Wolf as Cyanospora albacebra, based on what they thought was the color of the spores. And then it was later renamed to Robergia albacebra. And uh, it disappears from the trunk at about 40 to 50 years. And it seems to be related. Now I have yet to see any actual research on this. And again, this would be a great thing to research but it makes sense is that it disappears from the trunk um, as, the, <clears throat> as the heartwood starts to mature around 40 to 50 years. As the heartwood mature, the sapwood starts to diminish. And if you've ever touched one, the bark on these trees when they're you know, 20 to 30 years old, it's very sticky. And that's because that sap, and you can see little chunks of dried up sap up there. And right there, the sap oozes out through the bark. <clears throat> and once the hardwood matures, this, that oozing starts to stop. It doesn't do it, do it so much anymore. In fact, a cedar chopper once told me that, yeah, we wait for the white bark fungus to uh, stop growing on the trunk. And that's when we know that the hardwood is mature and will make a good post. But uh, it only first disappears on the trunk. And then eventually the branches, about 100 years later on the twigs, and finally when the trees, you know, like 200 to 300 years old, most of it will be gone. <clears throat> and it's important, important to kind of notice this uh, in relation to the golden cheek warbler, which is our endangered little bird, is that they cannot pull these little thin strips of the bark if it's sticky, you know? In fact, they, the warbler does not start using the bark until the trees reach about 40 to 50 years of age, which is when the heartwood matures. So there's a definite correlation between the sap that's being secreted and the fungi. <clears throat> Another way to kind of know uh, how old, now if you have a pioneer thicket, you can find the largest trunk you know, the uh, inside of the bush and measure it this way. But uh, this picture here in the middle, if you measure straight across, you get the diameter about four and a half feet up. It does get a little more tricky inside of a, uh, a bush, you know, a bushy cedar. And this one here is 32 inches wide. And this means it's at least 320 years old. And uh, could be as much as 600 years old, but it's, you can tell people it's at least 320 years old. If you have bushes that have you know, like a six inch wide trunk is the largest one. Well, you can say it's at least 50 to 60 years old. So even though people have the impression, a lot of people think that they grow really fast, but like all junipers, they grow slow. However, they can pioneer and spread across a degraded area really quickly because they produce so many fruits. So we really just need to let the thickets do their job. Uh, pioneering thickets of bushy cedars have been working hard to restore hill country soils and karst 
to increase groundwaters, we need to let them do their job and adopt sustainable solutions that work with them to restore both wooded areas and prairies. We also need to identify and conserve regenerating and old growth tree mountain cedar cover, the forest, the woodland, and whenever possible so that they may continue to protect the soil and the karst. And this picture on the left there is just a perfect example of this area that's highly degraded and you have this advancing front of these uh, of pioneering thicket of bushy cedars and they've aged to the point where they've dropped enough uh, leaf litter and uh, it boosted the soil fungi that you get a little sprinkling of grass growth under there. So that's the end of the presentation, but now I always like to kind of keep it short so I can answer questions. So, and also wait, 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 before we go further, let's bring in not Lisa O'Donnell, but here, wait, I'm gonna exit, stop sharing. <laughs> we have a guest here. Yay. Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. There Hi, everybody. Is. Thanks. So Lisa's Thanks. going to provide an update on the research uh, that's being conducted at the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. And it's just beginning. It's really exciting. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, is it OK if I share my screen? Yeah. Does that work? Yes. Great. And thanks so much for everybody having me. I'm going to just give you a little overview of sort of things we've been doing that are relevant to what we've been talking about and then the project um, that we're just starting in Balcones. And um, I'm at the Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, and so we've already kind of talked about what mycorrhizae are and that there's these two different kinds. Um, my favorite thing about arbuscular is that they're actually sort of plant roots before plants had roots. So they're the guys that helped plants move to land about 450 million years ago. And then our ectos are really interesting. They've actually evolved over 60 times um, throughout evolutionary history that we know of because it's really hard to find fossils, of course. And these are the ones that make the mushrooms that we're going to be a little more familiar with probably. And one of the things I've been looking at is that they provide a whole bunch of different ecosystem services. So pictured here on the left, sort of what your healthy community and ecosystem might look like if you have good a good native mycorrhizal community versus on the right, if it's reduced and shifted. And in particular, my favorite topic is that they're really part of this water cycle that we have. So they're helping plants um, lift water from deeper soil layers on a nightly basis. They're also helping transport water horizontally across the landscape and helping with the evapotranspiration and water use efficiency of the plants, which is really cool. And the scientific literature, um, we now have enough to show that a lot of different activities are reducing these. So Elizabeth's been talking about a few of those. And it could be as widespread as just general pollution deposition and drought, land use change more specifically, and localized um, invasive species, and even the pesticides that we might apply to try and get rid of some of those non-native plants. And the good news is that research has shown we can actually restore them, and it really helps with our plant survival, our plant productivity, um, growth, as well as diversity. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is I was a manager at the Navy for about a decade, and I really wanted to know when I came back to do my PhD <laughs> if any of this science was actually making it into management. And unfortunately, sort of the bad news is that for the most part, it's not. So you can see here that if we look at a systematic collection of management plans, a lot of the time on the right there at the top, fungi are actually considered a threat or completely ignored in management plans, and that's all fungi. <laughs> and then if we look at the plans where actually fungi are mentioned, um, even still diseases are really the main topic, followed by mushrooms as a harvestable item and lichens 
as an air quality indicator, but mycorrhizae and endophytes, for instance, um, are pretty much hardly ever mentioned, even when fungi appear in the plant somehow. And so um, we've been working on some uh, projects in Arizona where we've been looking at that mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal restoration aspect, and we've been finding that invasive vegetation, so I'm talking about exotic vegetation that is actually um, monopolizing land and taking it over from native plants, they are leaving uh, these legacies in the soil that are reducing our native plant survival when we do restore, and that if we restore our mycorrhizal fungi, it actually can help. Um, but the site conditions and the timing also play a part as well. Um, you can see here from our study, like in year one, that inoculation actually doubled survival, but in year two, we tripled survival. So it can change over time. And then if even if we look at areas that weren't affected by that tamarisk legacy or invasive species, um, we can see here that timing matters. So we get different results in year one and year two. And we can also see that those plant fungal pairings really matter. So we got our fungal mycorrhizal inoculant from these, uh, these guys right here, these different populations in particular, this bright red one. And you can see that it has very different effects on the different populations of trees. And so these are just the source populations of trees and how they reacted differently in both the first year and the second year. And that first year, um, we might actually expect a little decline there because that relationship is just getting started. And so it takes some effort on the plant's part while it's trying to adapt. We've also been finding um, in some of my collaborations with folks in Texas, actually, who are modelers, that mycorrhizae can help our endangered birds. So this was a modeling effort that we did to incorporate um, the rates from the literature and if we include mycorrhizal inoculation or don't. And on the, um, in the red line, we can see that we get a much better result after six years for our habitat restoration and our birds than we do if we don't inoculate, which is that blue line. Because the canopy is just gonna increase much faster, the suitable habitat's gonna be much better, and it's gonna be better faster. And I always think that we don't show enough pictures of mycorrhizae. So I just wanted to show you some of the beautiful mycorrhizae that we've been getting um, and what they are here in Arizona on cottonwoods and willows. And then we're now starting this project in Balcones, which is amazing, in the oak juniper woodlands, looking at some of the same ideas. Um, and there's just a wealth of interesting questions. So you can see on the right here are actually oak and juniper roots intertwined going down into the caves underground. And so some of the questions revolve around how those two trees might be working together, not just through their roots, but through their mycorrhizae as well, and what other plants um, they might also be helping to support through those common mycorrhizal networks. And of course, um, St. Edward's Plateau and aquifer are very interested in water services, which is one of my special loves. And so looking at some of those questions about how are mycorrhizae contributing to those precious water services. And we have our uh, endangered golden cheek warbler. And so looking at how we can use mycorrhizae to help um, improve their habitat quality and quantity so they can be more successful. And so as we get started on this project, um, we're gonna be doing, we're sort of in the planning stages now of trying to figure out our exact experimental design. And then in the fall, um, we're actually gonna be doing our first root collection and we are looking for volunteers. So if folks are interested, um, I'll give you my email address at the end here. I would love to hear from you. We're gonna be organizing some trainings on how to do field collection of roots, um, transporting them and properly handling them so they can be useful scientifically. And then also um, working with folks in an ongoing way to continue to do collections and start to look at some of those um, colonization questions that we have. And tons of people contribute to this. I just wanted to show you all the amazing people here because hopefully we'll um, be talking about all the amazing people there who've contributed in the future 
because this work just wouldn't be possible without all kinds of help, including sponsors and collaborators and volunteers and field techs. Um, so this is my email. And if you're interested in partaking, I'd love to hear from you. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the Arizona Mushroom Society has actually helped fund a lot of the research um, in Arizona as well. And I was thinking, um, rather than sort of this whirlwind that I'm giving you at the moment, it might be fun to, if you guys are interested, hold like a joint meeting and talk about some of the research updates um, in a little more detail. And also that would give folks like an option, opportunity to maybe do some small breakout groups and meet people, which can be kind of fun. Um, yeah, and so in summary, Mycorrhizae do amazing things, but are often ignored, unfortunately, despite their ecosystem services and our consistent scientific evidence to restore them. Restoration of them can be very effective, um, but it does need to be done correctly, and there's a lot of room to fine tune those methods for even better results. So we really want to be restoring those native, diverse mycorrhizal communities. Not only that, but pairing them appropriately with our site and our plants. Um, that we can get neutral to negative results if we're using things that are mass produced and off the shelf. So just a quick note there to be very cautious about that. And yeah, if you guys are interested, I'd love to do a joint session with the Arizona Mushroom Society. That might be kind of fun. And if you would like to volunteer, um, we would love to hear from you. And a big thank you to Balcona's Canyonlands Preserve for making that possible and that email address as well in case anybody's interested in partaking. That's great, Amy. It's, it's very exciting to, I mean, it's Amy, <laughs> uh, Lisa, it's, it's so exciting to have this research and to have the city of Austin doing this kind of research because, you know, when cities start, start stepping in and doing things like this, it starts to get more recognition. Mm. Wow. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Wow, Lisa, that is incredible research. And I definitely want to learn more on how you do the collections and data analysis. And uh, we're definitely um, interested in helping you pull volunteers. So let's definitely get in touch. And uh, that's going to be a great, great way for people to learn in our own backyard. Um, and that joint session sounds great. So this has been a very lovely myceliation. And Elizabeth, that was great. So we want to give away um, a book tonight. And so the way we like to do it, just to make sure that we're being fair, is the first person to sort of answer the question that Elizabeth's going to ask in the chat um, will be the winner. So everybody get your keyboards ready. Get your fingers warmed up. <laughs> and um, Elizabeth, when you're ready, we can ask the question and then we'll um, get into more Q&A after that. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. So this was just a test to see if y'all were listening. Uh, uh, of the ectomycorrhizal fungi, how many species have been documented, documented worldwide? All right, looks like, I remember seeing 240, was that right? Yeah, that's where the, our muscular mycorrhiza, the ecto. The ecto, so we have, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> Did we get anything correct yet in the chat? I'm trying to open my chat. There we go. Ah, oh, wait, wait, wait. I see Kayla with tree folks. 20,000. Correct answer. Yes. Good job, Kayla. 20,000. So we'll get your, um, if you can, um, I'm going to put our email in the chat. If you can send us your mailing address and we'll have that shipped to you. All right. <laughs> That was fun. Okay, so yeah, so I um, wasn't seeing, let's see. 
there were any questions that I missed in the chat and I'm going to look over on YouTube as well. Um, does anyone have any questions they want to ask directly and feel free to unmute unmute. I see lots of, that is so cool. I, I, could, <laughs> I can ask a question. All right. Um, I was curious, one thing I actually wanted to study as an undergrad, I just had like a semester to do it and I didn't, I didn't ever actually do it because I ended up doing a different project, but I was curious about um, if uh, ash junipers, if there's any research that points to them being allelopathic towards other plants or basically having chemicals that inhibit the growth of other other plants in the area? Yeah, there, the, yeah, there's research on it um, because, I mean, and that whole thing kind of started back in, um, what was it, like 1970s or so when a Texas A&M student got a bunch of cedar flakes, took them to Texas A&M and did a research study where he planted plants straight in the cedar flakes that were a byproduct of the oil extraction. And his uh, results, uh, it, it, you know, he said, yeah, that there's a, that, that the germination rates seem to be slowed down and all that. So he concluded that they're allelopathic and that has stuck since then. Malcolm Beck, who owned the uh, uh, garden he, he was one who provided the cedar flakes. So he decided, well, wait a minute, this is like, the primary product for my business, way, <laughs> you know? So he decided to do his own research. And what he found is that um, it has to do more with like uh, when bacteria are, are breaking down, maybe it wasn't just bacteria, but whatever it was that he was studying at the time that were, were breaking down the wood, they pull nitrogen from the soil. And so if it's like, a 100% cedar flakes is going to be pulling nitrogen for the soil and therefore that will stunt the growth of plants. Okay, so that's what that's based on. And then uh, Yvonne Yeager did a thesis on it, uh, Texas A&M, and she did, did all kinds of studies and, and she said, yeah, I'm just not finding any chemicals. Now she did a lot of infield study as opposed to trying to create some lab situation. So she was doing actual field studies. She said that any kind of growth inhibition comes more from the matted leaf litter that, you know, I discussed, as, as I say, over time, as animals and wildlife start to move in, they start to break it up, and then more stuff will start to grow, that it also can uh, have to do with the lack of uh, a seed bank. There might not be much of a seed bank, you know, from severe erosion. So there's a multiple, you know, answers to that. But more recently, and I think it was a Bush, uh, Lisa O'Donnell, do you have the name of the article? What was it, Bush? Uh, these two women, they did research. And just recently, like 2018, they said, yes, it is a lethal pathic. But when I looked at the research, again, it was a lab setting where they extracted the oil from the leaves and poured it on top of the seedlings. Well, no plant's gonna be able to grow with that, you know? And uh, further studies have actually shown that when you extract uh, anything from like blue gramma grass and then you water it with that, even the blue gramma will be, its growth will be stunted by its own stuff being poured on it. So it, I, I always try to stick to in-field studies that study things like that because you know you know how complex ecology is and a lot of times when you tease it out and you put it into a lab setting it, it's going to lose that more holistic viewpoint and all the interactions that can be going on so um, it's not a lethal pathic out in nature let's just say that out in the field but it can be in the field in a laboratory setting where it's concentrated <laughs> I don't know how to give a short answer, do I? <laughs> no. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Holly asked what, um, and this just relates to your last uh, answer, uh, what do you mean by seed bank? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's the seed that builds up over time in the soil. And, you know, when you get soil erosion, you're not just losing the soil but you're losing all the little seeds in there 
you know, if you uh, are mowing your backyard and then you stop mowing, all these little plants will start to pop up. Well, a lot of times they're popping up from seeds that have been just resting, you know, sitting there in your soil, just waiting for you to stop mowing and they pop up everywhere. So it's the seeds that are, all, that are just in the soil. So that's just called the seed bank. Gotcha. Um, so I saw that Liz Bowman is also here. She may have just jumped off though. Um, no, are you I'm here. You're here? Oh, I'm good. Here. Actually, I just oh, raised my hand. So it was perfect, oh, good, timing. Good. perfect timing. I'm like, oh, we gotta get everybody in Arizona and all the um, mycorrhiza people myceliating. So everyone, this is, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Liz Bowman. I'm a postdoc at UT. Um, and I did my graduate work in Arizona in the Sky Islands, working with um, ectomycorrhizae and the endophytic fungi of ponderosa pine. Um, currently, I'm working on grasses, looking at how invasion of grasses changes the soil microbial community. So moving a little away. But I had a question related to Chris's question about um, not so much allelopathy, but you know this phenomenon that with ectomycorrhizae fungi, you have um, kind of this positive feedback and selection for the same species for con specifics um, versus with our buscular mycorrhizal fungi where there's evidence that they accumulate a lot of soil pathogens. So you have more um, selection for other species, uh, like I think it's called like species coexistence. Um, and I, I'm familiar with this, you know, in pine forest where I worked, you would see you know, low understory um, community, you know, not many species there, um, but just these pure stands of pine. And you see this like in East Texas with loblolly pine. Is this something that happens in these um, old growth stands of juniper also, since they are conifer and they, they do have both AM and EM, ectomycorrhizal and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi? You, you mean, um... Why, why are you trying to say that? Because the old, old stands of mountain cedars can be uh, solid, like, like it's mostly mountain cedars, uh, like a, mm -hmm. that's a cedar break is dominated. Uh, it's not hundred percent, but it is dominated. Yeah. But also we'll have juniper oak woodlands, which are actually more common. Uh, so it's gonna kind of be dictated by that of what spe other species are present, I would think. Hmm. Would um, you but, expect? But no, one's, no one has actually done the studies on. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean that's what I'm saying is like we desperately need that kind of research to answer these questions because it should, it would help. Uh, gosh, just land management strategies and things like that. There, it's because people have been so determined to get rid of the trees that they haven't spent any research dollars to something that would be more valuable. Yeah, yeah, and in South Texas, where I do most of my field work, um, they do that chain root plowing, and they do it very frequently where they have a prickly pear, Opuntia cactus, which just causes it to create this like pure stands of prickly pear, which, you know, cattle can't graze there. It's really interesting to see these strategies and how much they fail. <laughs> well, it's, and, and it's just like if you're going to be yanking roots out in that karst, uh, that karst geology, these roots that are literally it's like and, and i really well, I, i've been looking trying to find more and more research on this is that it appears that the the roots and the vegetation cover the soil the microbes are all interconnected with the carbonate cars that there's this yeah. you know cycling back and forth you know and i was talking about how you have that bacteria down there that's helping to eat at the limestone they're all kind yeah. of working together you know and it's just when you yank out the roots, you're just destroying all of that. And, and then, yeah. then we, we get flash floods, next flash flood, bam, it just seals everything off. It's, it's how, how deep do the roots go? Like you showed that picture of the juniper and oak roots that were intertwined. How deep was that? Well, the, uh, uh, the, the juniper roots have been shown to go down. Now, this is kind of strange is that in the, in the hill country, <clears throat> now, if you know about karst, if you're looking at a cross section, I mean, it's bumpy, it's all over the place. It creates a gazillion micro, you know, uh, habitats just based on different depths. 
<clears throat> and what research by, I think it's mostly like Susan Schwimming down at uh, Texas State University. She's one of the ones going with this, uh, leading uh, the research is uh, that they're finding that where the soils are less than about 18, 24 inches, that uh, the oaks and the junipers will grow their roots really deep. Now the junipers mm -hmm. only get down about 25 feet deep. Uh, the oaks can get up to around 60 feet deep. And it's not just them, but they, you know, they, they list all the, uh, about 10 or 12 different you know, species, but I'm just mentioning those, the live oaks in specific, specifically. But out in the more rolling uh, areas, like let's say around Johnson City or something where the terrain's more flat and level and you have soils that are four to six feet deep, it's weird because the roots aren't going much deeper. They're, they're kind of like, once they go down, they hit the limestone, they're kind of stopping at that point. So they're not going much deeper. And it's strange. It's like, why is that happening? Yeah. You, you know, I, I find that really, really fascinating, but it's, it's weird because it's almost counterintuitive. You yeah. know, you, you typically you think that trees do better where it's deeper, but when you have this uh, karst that they're able to grow on top of and create their own environment as they grow down, they're able to handle it where it's more shallow. Mm -hmm. so therefore they actually survive better where it's shallow where the depth to the paralithic bedrock which is the upper broken part of the karst you know the real fractured stuff so where the more shallow that is the better the trees seem to to grow and i'm not exactly sure why but that every time what if it's like I, access to nutrients or something <laughs> well they're able to actually access the the vado the vadoso i mean that's mainly more with the oaks because they get a lot deeper uh so you have the epicarst on top you have the vados and then you have the lower part where the aquifers are and the vados is where you have like your cave systems and all that and then the epicarst is the more fractured top stuff now once it's fractured grasses can get in there but like I'm saying is that this right in has gotten all closed up. The grass is, uh, they can't do that. They can't handle it. So they need something else to come in first to fracture and reopen it. Um, and so on top of areas where they're able to access the epicars and Bedos waters, they do fine during droughts. I mean, you know, live oaks are actually kind of like a Pleistocene relics, you know, they're, they're, they're not as newly evolved to all these droughts and all that. But if you're driving around, you know, you'll suddenly see those a giant grove of live oaks. It's juicy and green in the middle of a drought. Well, that's because it has cave water access. Hmm. And hmm. I think it'd be fascinating to find out what kind of um, fungi or bacteria are growing are down in those caves that could be supplementing the water uptake yeah. and nutrient uptake take at that point but the thing is is like i was talking about this interconnection the deeper those roots go down as they go down they're literally are excreting and you know how there's that connect that symbiosis with the fungi where they feed them they feed them and the roots will excrete that carbon which is what the fungi want as they excrete the carbon that also kind of adds to the uh to the uh limestone dissolution that causes all the dripping that eventually goes to the caves and find, forms all those drip, you know, the speleothems and st stalagmites or whatever. Uh, it's just an incredible system that is all interconnected and yes. back to the, yanking them out with chaining. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that's, yeah. um, that's really interesting. There has been some work on, you know, this vertical, vertical stratification of um, mycorrhizal fungi on roots and, but it's never been that deep, you know, they've gone down I'd like to see it get, get done in the caves. Exactly. Cave studies. To yeah, that would be really interesting. Up there. And there are, there's like these, uh, like George Vinny, and then you have the Te Texas Cave Society. You know, they yeah. could provide access to these caves. Yeah. We actually really have cool. a lot of members um, that are part of the caving society and group that are also members of our group. And oh. it's sort of been like, where do we, Perfect. when do we like all <laughs> connect you know, we've been talking about you know going to west cave and everything we've been sharing like there's this many species of fungi from caves and like we got to find a way to collaborate with y'all <laughs> but yeah yeah this sounds like a fun fun project and in, into into the future yeah when we get to that point in our uh 
researching this. And it'd be cool to see if it's just bacteria or there's also fungi that are helping to dissolve that limestone, you know, and just, it's just, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just this whole giant unseen ecology, ecological system. Mm -hmm. It's very fascinating. There's so much entangled and unseen, right? Yeah, we need more mycologists here. So I'm glad that Lisa's going to be doing work here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and Liz, you're the only mycologist at UT, right? I don't want to say only. I'm sure there's others I don't know about, but I'm the only one that I know about, but there's probably others. Yeah. I just don't know about them. There are a lot of people at UT. Tell me you're there not are. the only one. Oh my God. Well, Christine Hawks used to be here and she was one of the main, you know, fungal ecologists. But as far as I know, there aren't too many. There's some people doing work with bacteria. And um, Tom younger is started to do some work with microbes with his uh, sorghum studies but. and then there was the i mean it was all just research on the ants but finding the fungus and using that weird the fungus. fungus yeah the 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 tawny crazy ant study that just came out microsporidia is this weird uh parasite fungus that kind of breaks down the colonies after over time and we're going to be doing a talk on that in August. So. Uh, that breaks down the fire ant mounds? Uh, well, so this one's the crazy ant. So they're, um, they are the ones who like eat the electrical wires and they just, <laughs> they're crazy. <laughs> they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to drop a, an article from Texas Monthly um, about the, the long-term study because it was about eight years, right? That they were studying. Yeah, they've been working on it a long time. Uh, they've done a, a couple of releases. They just found it accidentally. They happened to notice that, or Ed Ed LeBrun, he's the main researcher, and he just happened to notice that some ants had these distended abdomens. Uh, but yeah, I'll let him talk about it. He's a really awesome researcher. Yeah, that's a, I love the title. Apopka left it acid spewing crazy ants invaded Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had an invasion at my my house and that's kind of I'd been fascinated by them just because I mean they really move in very erratic crazy ways and so I knew they weren't they weren't like any ant that I'd ever seen and so um, I think I caught them in time that they hadn't I mean they hadn't eaten through electrical wires yet but the colony was pretty new or just getting established, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, so here's a question. Do mountain cedars contribute to cedar fever? Um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, and But remember how I was talking about how historically they were mostly like woodlands and forests and the trees were older and all that. The older ones don't produce as much pollen because they're older, but these pioneering thickets, because they're bushes, they're more dense, and they are young teenagers, they produce a lot more pollen. And, but thing that is interesting is how it's, the only people that really ask me about cedar fever are the city folks. People that live out in the country never ask me about it. And it's, I found out it has a lot to do with, uh, uh, the heat island effect and uh, urban pollution. Mm. And if you're taking hot showers, use it that have chlorine and chlorine water. So mm. I cover all that in my book, just kind of like trying to help people out, give them some tips of how to not make the suffering so much. Because uh, I used to, I used to suffer too, but it's not so bad now that I've done some of those things. Mm -hmm. But yes, yes, and you know, here this is interesting is that. Uh, their pollen is so tiny, and that's one reason why we're so affected is, is by it's, it's so tiny. Those N95 masks we all wore through the pandemic, I bet you anything cedar fever was not as bad because it's small enough to keep the pollen out. Um, but because the pollen is so tiny, it will go airborne and can actually cloud seed to form rain, but the rain doesn't fall here, it, fa it falls to the northeast. <laughs> take that yeah arkansas 
Missouri. I don't know. Take our pollen. Um, yeah, does anyone else want to unmute and ask a question? Here, I see another one in the chat. In what ways can ash junipers be managed appropriately to help mitigate the increased risk of wildfires and utilize within the wildland urban interface? Uh, well, one of the things, like I was saying, it's uh, uh, finding ways to uh, increase the health of the soil and to increase the karst porosity because the more water that's in that epic karst, the more hydrated the plants are. And ash juniper mountain cedars are only moderately flammable. Uh, other things such as rosemary, sumacs, and yopons are highly flammable, yet a lot of people plant those underneath their roof overhangs, which is not a good idea. So the best thing you can do is not to have brush piles it, because the brush piles have contained dead mountain cedars and dead vegetation is highly flammable. Um, also not pruning them up and allowing tall grass to grow, grow underneath because our trees are kind of short and uh, just, you know, they're pretty stunted compared to other places in the country. So if tall grass grows underneath them, they have a higher likelihood of torching. So you should keep them in kind of thickets, but little islands. But the best thing that something like the Balcones Canyonlands is doing for the wider natural areas is installing fire breaks and shaded fuel breaks. Uh, you can go to mountaincedars.com, which is a page that I kind of manage and I have more information about that. And also I have a, uh, on, on that website, I also have a whole diagram of what you can do around your house to make your house be more, uh, to be more fire, fire resistant. <clears throat> Any others? I could ask another question. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit more about the bacteria that was limestone eating? Was that from across, was that from another country? Is that what you were saying? Well, the, the picture I showed was from another country. That was from like Egypt. The actual, it was the only picture I could actually find of it. <clears throat> that that was the one that they found on an Etruscan tomb uh, near Egypt or something like that, you know, where it was actually eating away at the limestone tomb. But the uh, research I have, and if you want to send me an email, I can send you the link to the article. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, uh, the research that, the, uh, that I, here, oh wait, actually, hold on. Might be able to give you the name of it. I might have it over here somewhere. It's here, let me see if this is it. Um, I think it's from uh, research that was being conducted in China because China has more research into karst than any other country. One reason is because the karst in China is extremely extensive. Uh, oh, here it is, here it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this was done, yeah, in China. It says soil bacterial community composition and diversity respond to cultivation in karst ecosystems. And I do have the link. And here, wait, I'm trying to figure out how to. I can't. Is Leah Cherner here? Yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to do a message. That, oh, here's everyone, finally found it. Here is the link to the article. It's when I was doing my research, I, I, you know, I started having these bigger questions that weren't being answered by research being done in Texas or the Southwest. So I had to start looking beyond Texas to get the better research. And some of the best research uh, came out of China of all places. I mean, they, they are just so, and I think, it, like I said, it is uh, because the karst is so expansive there. They have so much of that carbonate karst there. 
Um, so that's it. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, I guess my concern was, uh, I was wondering if we are, if we're currently using any of these bacteria in, in Texas and. No, and, I don't know of anyone using them. And I would hope that uh, instead of just using this, but use this research as inspiration. Sure. Surely yeah. someone should be able to get down there into our limestone to see if there is a, a similar bacteria or even fungi that's serving the same purpose. Because, you know, as these pioneering thickets move across, you know, nature takes her own sweet time, right? So she takes a really, really long time to do things. So if we can do things to speed up the process of helping to restore the, these lands, uh, then that would be extremely helpful. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I give, you know, I meet with people throughout the hill country and landowners throughout the hill country and even into the adverse plateau, they're starting to hear about the fungi and the bacteria and they're starting, they're starting to hear about it and they are ready. They're like, please give us something. <laughs> so I think that this would be really, really cool research <clears throat> to figure out what we have that could be applied at the time when you're like installing something like a contour bias swell or something like that, that you inoculate the soil. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, no, I don't know anyone who's using that bacteria. Great. And so you said no one has uh, done the research to find that that bacteria is also here in our karst. Or, or that, yeah, correct. Or that, or that we have maybe some other type of bacteria that's doing it because they were, they were finding uh, that there's a phylum. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the, it seemed to be that there's a phylum of bacteria that, that are doing the limestone eating, but that the one that they studied was uh, uh, Rhizobialis, that that was the one that they actually focused on. Hmm. But no, that's what I'm saying is like, it, it, having Lisa start doing her studies at the BCP, it, groundbreaking it's it's so awesome it's the beginning it's the beginning it's it's so exciting and you know the adverse aquifer authority are starting also to do some really good research so that could be another place that could be tapped in for uh doing research and you know i also talked to april samson out at Sela ranch in johnson city and she's she's open to having some research projects like this out there as well yeah, you know, we just we need to get you know Dr. Brad Wilcox has really been spearheading the movement to show that he's the one who showed that when these pioneering thickets spread, that underneath the infiltration rates are higher, the the porosity of the cars gets becomes higher with time than the surrounding sparse grass. So it's a lot of his research is really just paving the way to new ways of thinking and let's get out of the box and start having bigger ideas, more holistic yeah. ideas. Yes. This is so incredible that you're piecing all this together for us and inspiring us. Um, did, so when you originally wrote your book, did you think of like the groundwater? Were you thinking about that aspect or did no, it come later? No. Yeah. No. I started off just trying to show that they are native <laughs> and, and just and peeling back the layers and I, I exactly because uh um that that was the very first thing I was told oh they're not native they're not native and at the time I was giving tours around the wild basin and so I, and the and the director there Mike Casper he said yes they are native he sent me to brother Daniel Lynch at St. Edwards University who then kind of became my mentor for a while. And then uh, he set me on my path and he gave me tons of information. And, I, you know, and then he connected me with Jack Slaughter because then every single time I was finding that I would come in and say, you know, dispute something and, and prove that what was being said was not true. Immediately people would turn around and say, oh, but they also do this. And so the next thing was that, you know, they hog water, they intercept all this water and all this stuff. So I, it just kept going. The layers kept coming and coming. And mm. it's just, it's just mind boggling. I remember, was it like 2001 or so? Uh, the International Society of Landscape Ecologists had their meeting, their symposium here in Austin. And at the, uh, 
when they had the final banquet, I decided to sit with a bunch of people from other places, not Texas, just to meet some different people. And when they found out I was from Austin, they all stopped talking. And then they finally said, so what do you think about this Juniper Sashiite? And I said, oh, actually, I'm writing a book around, about it to disprove a lot of stuff that's being said. And they just said, oh, thank you. Because they said, we just, we can't understand y'all's obsession with this tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were just, it was mind boggling to them about finding 101 ways of how to kill the tree. Yeah. And it's just, everyone's just been so hyper-focused on that. They haven't, I, instead, I decided, um, I, at first I was like, oh, you can't cut them. And I was like, no, that's not the ecologist speaking. And I realized mm -hmm. I had to step back. So I stopped for a little bit to see the bigger picture, started asking, why are they spreading? Mm -hmm. you know, not how can we stop it, but why are they spreading? And would you say like, um, like the biggest opponents, like I'm sure there's a lot still oh yeah um, have you seen some major like turnarounds or or i guess like who are who are the people that are the loudest would you say like in opposing this tree uh politicians uh policy makers like city people municipalities C yeah municipalities uh you know landowners are falling in line they, they i have like a little army out there <laughs> and because they know what they've been doing hasn't been working and they see mm -hmm. the logic of what I'm, you know, teaching it's, uh, but when I first, uh, Oh, developers. Yeah. Yeah. Of uh, course. yeah they're, they're developers probably ranchers too. No ranchers are actually, uh, they, they understand what I'm talking about because you know, I, I know how to talk their language and they, they understand mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. When I start talking to them about, the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s, half of them lived through that. So they understand when I'm talking about contour bias whales about, they understand that they have been told to clear cut everything to get more runoff so that the cities can have their water. I mean, that has been the goal is to maximize runoff. And that is what has caused the greatest desertification in Texas, you know? It's mm -hmm. desertified our soils. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, and, and I, they're finally starting to come around and see what has been happening. It, it's not working. It's not just not working, but it's causing their lands to just dry up and mm -hmm. fade away. Uh, you know, one of the biggest proponents is the, what's it? The, the uh, state water conservation, no, the state water enhancement plan. And, is that by the uh, Texas Water Resource Institute or the, I can't remember all the acronyms, uh, the, the Texas Water Development Board, one of those has been probably one of the worst ones because mm -hmm. they continue to espouse and to push all the outdated information that, yeah. we, you know, that's just, it's not even relevant. Or it's like- Are they open to even hearing the information or do they- <sighs> they just kind of fund like the research they want to hear. Well, they, they finally, you know, uh, they finally pulled the report and they lost the funding. When Brad Wilcox, when I was talking about, he got uh, 11 other scientists to get on and write a review to the water plan and mm -hmm. to say how horrible this is. That mm -hmm. this, you know, it's just, and so, and, and shortly after that, their funding was pulled. Mm -hmm. so somewhere in there, someone knew what he, what they were saying was correct. Hmm. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's Texas politics, you know? And, yeah. 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 It's, it's and are, are you able to talk to anyone in the, in any of these groups? Are they willing to listen? Um, I'm, uh, I'm building up my reputation, you know, slowly but surely, you know, so my book came out a year ago. I'm getting more and more people. Okay, now this was huge. Just, uh, just last Friday, I was at the Save Our Springs Alliance thing and the director of watershed protection for the city of Austin, he came up to me and asked for a copy of my book and he, <clears throat> and he, said he was very excited to read it. And, and that's huge for watershed protection. It's like a, a 180 for them if they were to start embrace some of the principles, you know, discussed in my book. 
Um, and I know like Lucia Athens with Office of Sustainability that she, she's been interested. So it's like, I'm starting to get my fingers in there and I'm making connections with people at the Edwards Aquifer, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm trying to make, you know, build up my army. That's what Bill Neiman, Native American Seed said. And he said, I have to start an army. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's a slow process and you know you have to just kind of keep going around but one of my goals is to actually is to start up a nonprofit called carbon eight like the number eight carbon okay. eight restore Ooh, i like that yeah and we're was, behind you so keep us posted oh, on i it. would totally want everyone all of y'all to be behind that um yeah. so you know, to training landowners how to specifically restore karst, the soil and the vegetation on top of carbonate karst in Texas. Mm -hmm. I could spread beyond Texas one day, but I'm just gonna focus yeah. on Texas, at least for now. Well, we have some um, questions in the chat on biochar. Do, does anyone wanna ask the question or we can just read it? <laughs> see. Um, your website has biochar, has a potential economic build uh, benefit does ash juniper biochar have any unique benefits compared to biochar made by other biomass sources? I, I have no idea, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I talk about it in my book about the, uh, the benefits about, we, we, you know how we use that charcoal burners and cedar choppers It's finding a way to bring back the charcoal burning, you know, because people just want to burn these brush piles. I'm like, but you're losing all that organic matter and all the carbon's being thrown into the atmosphere. What if we said we found ways to turn it into biochar? <clears throat> but as for how different it is than other biochar, I don't know. That is definitely more research that needs to be done. I mean, I mean, my book basically was about pulling together all this information and putting out questions, asking new questions, and saying this is what we need to be thinking about. And that's an excellent point there that would be a fascinating study could it just do it on its own because I was trying to find ways of how to uh to take advantage of the pioneering thickets as opposed to let's leave the old growth forest alone and said how can we use the pioneering thickets and that would be you know how I was talking about the contour bias whales mm -hmm. one thing I always thought would be neat if you could figure out a way of how to do it is that as you construct them you're, uh, when well, you start off by running through and shredding the area. So you create a fire break of sorts, and then you come in with a mini excavator and you dig out this very shallow, about a 12 inch deep, uh, uh, just, uh, it's like a linear retention pond. It's, it's a system of swales and berms, but before you do the, the berm part, is if you could put all the cut juniper under that then put the soil on top of it because that's how you make and make it like a giant linear charcoal kiln mm -hmm. you know and so it literally so that the charcoal be made on site and then which has become part of the soil it seems like if you could find a way to do that that would be really really beneficial mm -hmm. you know so, but yeah no i'd like to see more of the biochar integrated. Right. So so the the Clevera Coalition in New Mexico is hosting some biochar workshops. Yeah, I've been following different biochar stuff, but I haven't seen anyone really doing testing on our mountain cedar. That, that, that would be a good, good research project right there. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Well, let me check YouTube real quick, make sure. Leah, Leah, uh, Leah Turner, um, can you just send me an email? I mean, Leah's asking about information on the fungi, how it helps the oaks with the oak wilt related research. I just have that in PDF form, format. I don't know if I, can I add that into the chat, a PDF or can um, you? I think that you can add, it's really complicated because you have to connect to like Google Drive doesn't let you just upload any file. I can just email you, Elizabeth. What now? I could just email you. Yeah, yeah, just send me an email. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, and we can uh, we can link to that on our website too for anybody else that might have questions. Um, if you want to send it over to us. Yeah, because well. I like to see even more information on that is because I was still trying to pin down the information. 
of it appears that because it's an endophytic type of bacteria, it looks like, it, you know, that it's, it's in association with the roots. Can it survive without the mycorrhizal? Does it need the mycorrhizal to survive? You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, because it definitely I found in, uh, research that showed that the more mycorrhizal co coating the oak roots, more, it more protects them from the, the pathogen. But if you have the bacteria, is it, is it like a symbiosis between the fungi and the bacteria? You know, that would be really cool. And I haven't found that yet, mm -hmm. but I don't know if anyone's even researched that yet. Yeah. All right. Does anyone else have any last minute questions? And we'll get that link to that research on, on the event page for everyone that may want to read it. Um, I could ask another question. <laughs> Yay, more questions. Um, I think this will be my last one. It's kind of like the opposite of my first question. Have you found that um, junipers are a nurse tree to any specific species that you hardly ever see um, unless they were first growing under an ash juniper? Um, well, it does appear that the madrone, Okay, remember I told, uh, mentioned that with the fairy fingers popping up that, that it, it might be like madrone fairy fingers and the juniper creating some kind of symbiosis. The other thing are the, uh, it does seem that the, what is it, uh, Leah, help me. What's the cedar sedge, uh, Carrick's, uh, sub, what's the cedar sage, a sedge? The, she's name. The salvia romaria? No, 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 the, the oh. cedar Peter sedge, sedge. Oh, a sedge. I don't know which sedge it is. Well, yeah, I can't remember the anyway, but it's the cedar sedge and you almost always see it coming up underneath the junipers then spreading out from there. Um, but Definitely then- Mexican oh, silk tassel. I don't know about silk tassel because I'll see that coming up underneath oaks just as much. Okay. But, um, but um, I, there's uh, uh, orchids. And I, I have the name in, in my book uh, under the understory, but there definitely appears to be, uh, what is it, the, the crested coral root uh, orchids, which are have... definitely like what fungi related. So it's got to be in there and that, no, I still haven't found anyone who's done a study on that. And someone was mentioning it 20 years ago and still no one's done a study on that. I know of a spot to find them right now. I think they're still there. <sighs> But yeah, very are these cool the ones at St. Ed's or are they different <laughs> ones? Yeah, it's those. Yeah. Yeah. There's I, was some gonna that. I, was gonna, I was gonna include that in my PowerPoint. And then when I looked around, I couldn't find any research on it. So well, that was a good way to end it. That's actually our next topic. <laughs> our next topic um, uh, is mycoheterotropes. So we're gonna have um, Grace Stark. Um, or no, sorry, Leah Mycelia, um, who um, is in the Pacific Northwest, but um, she's going to be talking about some of the Texas ones and then just generally the ecology and their um, mycorrhizal connections. And um, so we're very excited for that. And um, I thought of Grace Stark because she was in town when we were going to see one of the orchids last summer that came up in August down on Barton Springs. And she's um, doing her doctorate at UC Berkeley. And so she wanted to take a soil sample so she could look at the mycorrhizal and try to figure out what type it was. And we just kind of missed connections, but hopefully, I, I don't think we'll get rain this year, but, but I don't know if it matters. I think she might, someone might still be able to maybe look at the mycorrhizal still in that area. Um, but anyways, yeah, next month, everybody, we're going to talk about mycorrhizal, or sorry, not next month, July. So next month we're doing soil microscopy. And then in July, we're doing mycoheterotropes. So yeah. All right. Well, if uh, we don't have any other questions, we will say good night and thank you so much, Elizabeth, for such a wonderful presentation. We learned so much.
and I'm ready to learn what's in the what's in our caves. Become <laughs> <laughs> cave dwellers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, good night. And if you want to get some of the links in the chat before we sign off, you can download the chat to get links and stuff. So don't forget to do that. Um, it's like a little ellipses where you can save the chat. Um, all right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. This is joy. <laughs>